Judges chapter number eight, and if you'll wait, I'll have you stand here in just a minute. We've been going through the book of Hebrews on Sunday morning, and in chapter 12, it starts beginning to talk about the chastening hand of God and how similar that that is to an earthly father. And uh, so my first thought was I would preach Hebrews chapter 12 and preach it about earthly fathers. But uh, to be honest, the text uses earthly fathers as an illustration, and really the point of the passage is our Heavenly Father. And uh, so instead of manipulating it a little bit, I'm just going to wait till next week and preach on that. And uh, today I want to take a time out and preach on fathers. And uh, this is the way it works. I told this to a group yesterday. I was preaching at a, a, a father's uh, cookout, and this is the way it works. On Mother's Day, we all get together and we talk about how awesome and great mothers are. And that's true. And then we get together on Father's Day and we talk about how miserable and worthless you are. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to break suit. Uh, probably going to continue that thing. Not, not that we're miserable. Without Christ, we're pretty miserable. Uh, but uh, the dependence or the need of fathers in the life of children is such an important thing. And Brother Corey alluded to the idea, the, the reality that within our society, fatherlessness is on a rampage to, to the degree, to the degree in certain segments of our society, we have seen an elevation of almost 80% growth in fatherlessness on the scales of going from about 10% of, in 1960, born without fathers, to close to 70%. Overall, if you were to take all the different segments of American society, you would see at least a 40 to 50% growth of homes without fathers. Now, let me just state before I even get into the text that this does not mean that a home that does not have a father is hopeless. Because the Bible says in um, Psalm 127.10, When thy father and mother forsake thee, the Lord shall lift thee up. Amen. And even as Brother Corey mentioned, that the Bible talks much about God being our earthly father. And we'll discuss that next week in Hebrews chapter number 12. And, and he gives us pity. And he does remember that our frame is, is, is but dust. And he does remember our iniquities, it says in that passage, our iniquities and sin no more as far as the east is from the west. And praise the Lord for the grace of God that exists for the broken home. And to be honest, every home needs the grace of God because at some level, every home is broken. But we would have to also recognize the societal difficulty that is producing a, a child that is at great disadvantage. Is at great disadvantage when there is a lack of a father. And to be honest, there needs to be some assistance. There needs to be some help. There needs to be a strong church in your life so that God can put men into your children's lives and they can be there as role models. You need extended family and grandfathers and uncles that are, by God's grace, able to be there. And, and there's hopefully help that exists and you can, you can find that help and you can have access to that help. But to be honest, to be fair, there is a disadvantage. There is a disadvantage when you do not have a father and a mother in a home. To say that that is not the case would be disingenuous. It also would be not evidentiary true. And so I want to take a few minutes this morning and kind of really just uh, touch on the topic of fathers and the role that they should play in the lives of children. And I, I know there's so many different facets to it that I'm not going to be able to, to go to all of them, but I, I want to speak on this particular idea that intent is insufficient to transform the life of a child. Intent is insufficient to transform the life of a child. 
And to be honest, if we have any relationship with the Lord, if we, if we want to serve the Lord, we want to honor the Lord, we want to please the Lord, and even though we know we fail and we mess up and, and life is not uh, the way sometimes we want it to be, but, but we want to do what's right and, and we desire to raise our children right, and we have intent, there's probably some intent, you have the intent or desire that your children would want to serve God and want to please God. You'd love, you, in fact, you would be awed and you'd be thrilled if your children served God and pleased God and gave their heart to God. You would be their biggest fan. You have that intent. And you're like, that's awesome. I, I want that for my kids. I'm telling you, intent is insufficient. And we're going to see an example of that in the Old Testament of a father who had some intent. There were some other issues there. We're going to talk about the life of Gideon for a few minutes. So let me just remind you of his life, and let me just remind you of his story, just briefly, so I can kind of remind you where he's at and see if you can identify with him in some ways. The children of Israel, here in the book of Judges, and it starts there in chapter number 6, and we're going to end up reading in chapter number 8, were under the oppression of the Midianites. And what the Midianites would do is they would wait till harvest time. They would wait till everything is ripe and everything is, uh, is prying for the picking and they would have a raiding parties and they would come in and they would raid and they would take the best of the crop of the children of Israel and they would take that which was primed and ready uh, for benefit and for life and they would come in and they would take it all and then they would flee with it and they would be done and then wait for the next harvest time and they would come and do it again. This has been happening for years. We find Gideon in the book of Judges in chapter number 6. And the Bible says that he's hiding behind the wine press threshing wheat. To be honest, behind the wine press is not the place where you typically would thresh wheat. In other words, he's not doing it for the purpose of of fulfilling a, a commodity where he's going to market and he's, he's benefiting his family and he's going to market and he's bringing home resources. He's by there. He's not, he's not performing an occupation. He's simply surviving. He's threshing this wheat seemingly for the purpose of creating enough wheat for his family to eat and try to, to hide it from the Midianites. He's not being productive in life. He's just surviving in life. And you would say, well, what do you expect? Look at the societal pressures that are on him. Look at the, the oppression that exists around him. The Midianites were nothing to be scoffed at, nothing to laugh at. You couldn't just dismiss it. And I would agree with you. And that's where the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, and he says this to him, Behold, thou art a mighty man of valor. I just think God has a sense of humor. He could have said, hey, Gideon, I'm going to do something great. I know it doesn't seem like it, but just stay with me here. No, no, it's not what he said. He said, thou art a mighty man of valor. I can see in my mind Gideon looking up from the week. Who, me? <laughs> Keep it down. Shh. There's Midianites around here. And he says, Gideon actually responds, no, no, you don't understand. I am the least of my family. And my family is the least of our tribe. And our tribe is the least of the children of Israel. Clearly you are mistaken. But the angel says, no, 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 I'm not mistaken. And he will take Gideon through a, a few uh, things of uh, validation to show him that this is the angel of the Lord. And to be honest, Gideon is a great lesson. When he recognized it was the angel of the Lord, he went and he brought the sacrifice to the Lord, and then he, he, the, then he poured out the sacrifice. He's a great lesson of a man who is not where he should be surrendering to God when God confronts him. That's a great lesson. Thank you, Brother Ryan, because that's a tough lesson. For a man, when he's not where he should be, when he's confronted by the Lord, to surrender to God. In fact, you go through the story, the first thing God tells him to do is, he says, I want you to go to your father's house and tear down all the idols. So Gideon goes and gets some guys and in the middle of the night. They go down, tear all the idols at their father's house. Because wrong living produces wrong worship. And the men gather in the morning and said, who did this? And they're ready to kill Gideon. And his father stands up and said, listen, God told him to do it, okay? You, you can't have a problem with this. And, and protects Gideon a little bit. And then God says, okay, now you're ready. And he's going to send Gideon off to fight the Midianites. 
And if you know the story, it's an incredible story. He starts with 32,000 men. And God says, you have too many. Now, the Midianites are are beyond the number of the sand. It's estimated up to 300,000 of the Midianites. And he's like, whoa, 32,000 is too many? Yes, 32,000 is too many. And he diminishes the army through a couple tests. And he diminishes the army. And they drop down after the first test. And they drop down after the second test. And finally, they're down to 300 men. And God says, perfect. Perfect. Now I want you to go and fight against the Midianites. And we know the story, Gideon's fearful, and he's put out a couple fleeces, you know, and and now finally God gives him more validation by letting him hear one of the dreams of the Midianites and talks about this Midianite has this dream going, you won't believe this, but in my dream, the children of Israel basically defeat us, and there's some typology there, and, and they win, and Gideon wins. He's like, I don't even know who this Gideon is. And Gideon's like, wow, that's pretty cool. And so Gideon is engaged. And if you know the story, they go and they, they take the, the, the pitcher and they take the lantern and they surround it and they shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they break the pitcher and they, uh, they break the lantern and they light forth the whole place and the Midianites basically kill each other in confusion, thinking they're being attacked by a great army. It's a wonderful story. The timing is perfect. He says, I want you to do it at the third watch. At the third watch is when all, uh, there's changing of the guards and all the Midian night watch would have been coming back into camp and there would have been a changing of the guards. So as they wake up, they see soldiers coming. They just don't realize it's their own soldiers. God knows what he's doing, by the way. And so therefore they destroy each other. They fight against each other. And finally, these 300 men under Gideon will begin pursuing these Midianites. He'll pursue them, and finally he will catch the princes of the Midianites, and he will kill them. And and finally in chapter number 8, he's finally caught up to the kings of the Midianites. The kings of the Midianites, and he's captured these kings, and and finally they're they're in subjection to him. And it it is a monumental miracle moment in the life of Gideon. And can I just stop and say thank the Lord for miracle moments in our life? Especially because this miracle moment was brought on by obedience in the life of Gideon. I don't want to minimize this. This is God doing a miracle moment in the life of Gideon. It's an incredible thing. So let's read, beginning in Judges chapter number 8, of what takes place in this passage. And look what it says, and we're going to begin in verse number 18. I think it is of no little significance that the Midianites would come in and would take the crops when they're at their ripest. And here we are going to see a lesson about a story about a young man who is at his ripest moment. The Bible says in Judges chapter number 8 and verse number 18, Then he said unto Zeba, Gideon said unto Zeba and Zolmana, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabar? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. Now let me just stop here for a minute and and remind you of something. The Midianites have been in conflict with the children of Israel for a long time. Even way back when Moses was leading them in the wilderness, the Midianites, and the way the Midianites work, the Midianites are not an occupying army, they are a raiding army. And the way that they would raid is they would either come by and take all the crops like they're doing now, or when the children of Israel were traveling, they would come by and they would take the rear of the children of Israel. They would take the weak and the young. They would take the weak and the young. And that's a great way to cripple a nation is to take the weak and the young. Well, here, guess who they killed? They've killed the weak and the young, and he says, particularly, Gideon said, who'd you kill? He said, we kill people that look just like you. They look like children of the king. Listen, if you don't think that the world and the devil is out to, to destroy the children of the king, you're sadly mistaken. They are out. And the worst thing that we can contemplate is that we are not engaged in a battle. It's not a battle against flesh and blood. 
It's a battle, the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, against principalities and powers of the air. It's not a battle against a governmental system. It's not a battle against an educational system. It's a battle against the powers of the air, and he desires to take our heart away from the one who loves him the most and take him away from God and turn it over and give it to a worldly system that would destroy them and even their own heart that would lead them astray. He says, I, we killed people that look just like you. This is what Gideon says to him in verse number 19. And he said, they were my brethren, even sons, the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth. If you had saved them alive, I would, not, I would not slay you. Can I just stop here for a minute? The fact that they would leave them alive, they will not leave them alive. It is not in the Midian's nature to leave the enemy's soldiers alive. They destroy them. Can I tell you? It is not in the enemy's nature to leave your children alive. I mean that certainly in a spiritual sense. In fact, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may... Oh, I thought it said seeking whom he may trip up a little bit. And, you know, annoy. Lions don't annoy. Right? If lions simply annoyed, then the, then the gate at the zoo would be open. Go in. He may annoy you a little bit. That's not what lions do. They devour. They destroy. He says, he said, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It is the goal of the enemy to devour. And it seems like Gideon understood this. Can you put yourself in the perspective of Gideon to where this moment of victory, he would desire for that moment of victory to be shared? And who would he rather share it with than his son? I think this expresses some intent in the heart of Gideon. That he wants, it, he wants this victory to be lived out and expressed by his son. And this is a great victory. In fact, there's a representation. I don't want to preach another message, but let me just explain it to you. There's a great picture here by the kings of the Midianites. Their name means the same thing. Both of their names, Zolba and Zolmana, Zeba and Zolmana, mean the same thing. They both, both mean deprived of protection. Deprived of protection. And they just mean it in two different ways. One of them means deprived of in protection from protection from that which I am passionate or that which I would sacrifice for. In other words, I'm so passionate about something that it deprives me of protection. I am so sacrificing to something, so giving to something, that it puts me out of protection. That what in the world could that be, that something that I would be so passionate about that it would lead me away from protection? Hey, sometimes we can be passionate, so passionate about good things that it leads us away from the protection of God. We can be so obsessive about a career, or we can be so obsessive about a hobby, or we can be so obsessive about a sport or an activity that it actually leads us away from God and we're deprived of protection. Anything that leads you away from the protection is a dangerous thing. doesn't mean that it shouldn't be there, but it better operate within the priority of God's protection. Anything that you enjoy should be able to be enjoyed with your relationship with God not opposed to your relationship with God. Well, preacher, I kind of have, you know, my God stuff here, and then I kind of have my other stuff here. Listen, life with God cannot be compartmentalized. Amen. Guess how much of he, your life he wants? All of it. And he's a loving God. In fact, he wants you to live life abundantly. And so that passion, that career, that hobby, uh, that activity, that sport, that dream, Hey, praise the Lord, live it abundantly, but it better be able to function within your life with God, not opposed to your life with God. And there have been children that are so passionate, and even their parents have been pushing them in passion for something so much, whether it's the pursuit of career or money or fame, that actually leads them out of a protection with their relationship with God. I cannot, you can find the story after story after story that somebody started with a talent that they were using for God, then they ended up using uh, for themselves, and eventually they used it in opposition to God, 
and they were out of the protection. The other king's name also means deprived of protection, but it in the area of that which is secret, that which is under shadow. Can I tell you there are things sometimes that happen in secret that deprive you from protection? That's a dangerous thing to have things happening in secret that would deprive you from protection. And those things, and we live in a world that is under a massive epidemic of those things which happen in secret. We have made them readily available. The pornography industry is absolutely running rampant within our society, running rampant within men, and not just outside of the church, but inside of the church. And that effect of that which happens in secret, I promise you, will deprive you from protection because it is a prideful, prideful act. And the Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And to be resisted by God is to be pushed away by God, and you're outside of his protection. And so these two kings represent great dangers in life, great dangers in life. They are the kind of kings that would want to come and raid and take away the children when they're at the ripest. And now they're captured. Isn't that awesome? And Gideon wants his son to participate in the victory. Don't you want your son, your daughter, to understand that, that they can live a life with God and have passion? They don't have to be contrary to each other? But wouldn't you want your young person who's, who's contemplating marriage to understand that relationships can be with God and have passion? They don't have to be contrary to God? Man, that's a, that would be a beautiful victory. Wouldn't you want your child to understand that what, that what happens in secret that nobody knows about can greatly affect their relationship with God and others and you'd want them to have victory and if necessary confess and get right with God but even more so be strong enough to overcome the battle? Wouldn't that be awesome? Man, I have some intent for my children for them to love God and be passionate and for them to love God and overcome secret sin. That's my intent. That's my desire. And that's what I think Gideon's desire was, that his son would participate in the victory. And that would be awesome. So look what it says in verse number 20. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, and he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Now, you need to take out of your mind th this word youth. He wasn't like saying to a five-year-old. And the five-year-old's like, I don't know what to do with the sword. No, no. This is not a sadistic scene. Okay? In fact, the, the, if you look at the sequence of this, these guys have been on the run. I believe Jephthah is one of the 300. And here he is. He's a man. He's a soldier. He's still young, this, this Nahar word. He's still uh, not, not, not a, a person of, of patriarchal status. And so he's, you're, you're talking probably some level in, in the middle to late teens to early 20s is where Jephthah is. And he's at the point where victory is attainable. All, the intent of Gideon would be seen in the life of Jephthah. And he says, son, up and slay them. And Jephthah says, oh, I can't do it. I'm scared. Now, to be honest, a lot of times, and, and to be honest, I've preached this, and I preached it to teenagers, and I preached this idea. Dude, you got to get up and slay the kings of Midian, because they're out to get you. They're out to get you. Those things, whether they be of secret or they be of passion, that are going to try to take you away from God, you have to subject them to God, and you have to mortify the deeds of the flesh, the Bible says in the New Testament, and you have to bring them under subjection of God. You have to conquer them. And that's true, but the question is, how come he wasn't able to do it? Because intent never substitutes training. Intent of a father cannot substitute training. And what has Jephthah known from his father his whole life? Hiding behind the wine press. Not willing to stand up. Not, in fact, if you go back and look at Genesis or Judges uh, chapter number 6, 
The complaint of Gideon is, God, how come you haven't shown up? How come you haven't shown up? And this is the example that Jephthah has been given his whole life. And now we're at a moment of a miracle. I don't want to minimize that. It's a miracle moment in Gideon's life. It's an incredible thing. But you will not train your children by miracle moments. In fact, in the life of Gideon, here he is fearful, fearful and weak. And God does a miracle moment in his life. And he gets to a pinnacle place right here. And then after this, you keep reading. In Judges chapter 8, Judges chapter 9, Gideon will begin to descend back to what he originally was. He first was prideful in his fear. And then he became prideful in his triumph. And this is his life. And intent is never a substitute for training. Intent is never a substitute for modeling. Intent is never a substitute for investing. And here Gideon is wanting his son to participate. And guess what his son was like? His son was not like Gideon's moment. His son was like Gideon's life. Sometimes... I express my intent with a lot of passion. You know, I want my kids to do right. And I'll sit them down. I'm like, okay, I want you to do right. And you know, it's like a big halftime speech. I'm like, come on, we can do this. We can do this. That's just greatly expressed intent. It's a moment. Your children are not going to rise to the moment. Guess what they'll rise to? Your training. Now, Time out. The grace of God is abundantly available and can overcome the failure of any man. Amen. 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 So if you don't have the training or didn't have the training you should have had, plead and cling to the grace of God. That can overcome anything. In fact, we have plenty of stories in the Bible of men that were not properly trained by their father, and they did mighty and wonderful things for God because of the grace of God. Now, but can I tell you this? God did not put that child into your life just for his grace, even though his grace is needed. He put that child into your life for you to train. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. He put that child in your, in your life, not just so you could access the grace of God, but so that they could access the blessing of God. The grace of God is what I need in order to survive because of my weakness and my inability. The blessing of God is what I receive when I respond to God's word and obey and do what I'm supposed to do. Hey, I'm thankful for the grace of God. I need it. But I also want to see the blessing of God in my life. I want to see the blessing as I raise up, Malachi says, raising up a godly seed. Yes. Well, preacher, I want that too. Me too. Intent is insufficient. <laughs> Intent is insufficient. And if you're waiting for some miracle moment for the life of your children to change or be transformed, it's not going to happen. Even if you have your miracle moment, they will revert to the training. And sometimes we think this as Christians. If we could just have some big event. If we could just have, you know, a big conference on fathers. And praise the Lord for conferences. If we could just have a big youth conference to get our teens to do right. And, 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 we, could just, and we could just get them to go to camp and praise the Lord for camp. I'm all for that. And I'm all for the supplements. and all. But that is not what is going to produce. You know what's going to produce is each morning and each afternoon. In fact, God gave us the recipe. Can you turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 6? Back in... Near the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deut Deuteronomy in chapter number 6. Look what it says. It gives us the example of how we're supposed to be raising our children. Verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them 
diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thou shalt be there shall be frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and all the gates. He says, you want to train a child? Don't look for a miracle moment. Look for a lifetime of sitting and walking and laying and teaching them diligently the Word of God and make it be the activity of your hands and make it be the focus of your eyes and make it be the covering of your house that every single day you're sharing with them the Word of God and pouring unto them the Word of God. That is what trains a child to love God with all his heart. No, no, if we could just have a moment. Gideon had a moment. Hey, can you think of anything in the Bible that Jephthah did? When I say Bible heroes, the first one that comes to your mind, Jephthah, right? No, he did nothing. Now, can I, can I add on here? I believe he's partly culpable in this. He's partly culpable because even though Gideon didn't give him the training, he did give him the opportunity, and Jephthah did not come through. Listen, we're all culpable, fathers and sons and fathers and daughters. We're culpable, but I'm telling you, when it comes to the father, the expectation that God has is I put that child into your life, not for you to survive, not for you to hide from the Midians, I put them in your life so that you will train them diligently in the morning, in the noon, in the night, so they will be prepared to face a world that wants them. They'll be able to not, and not just survive. In fact, that's not the model of the New Testament, is the survival of Christians. You know what the model of the New Testament is? The triumph of Christians. Amen. That we would triumph in our own life, and the church of Jesus Christ would triumph over the gates of hell. The, the call is charge, not hide. And here's dads. You know, I really want my kid to serve God. That would be something special. Man, that would be awesome. Okay. And what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Well, isn't that what the church is for? Hey, let me just stop and say, praise the Lord for the church that can act as a complement or, when necessary, even a substitute. Praise the Lord for pastors and youth pastors and godly men in a church that can act as a complement or even a substitute. Because I do believe this. I, I don't know if I can do it on my own. I want to train my children, but I appreciate that there's godly examples in the church and other people that would come along my children and put their arm around them and love them and care for them and be an example to them. I'm thankful for that. And I don't think we should stop that. I don't think we should minimize that. I think we should enhance that. The idea that I can do it all by myself is probably a prideful activity, but the church is not the primary place where your children are diligently taught the Word of God. Can you imagine how much church services we'd have to have to fulfill Deuteronomy chapter number 6? Yeah. I don't even like you that much. <laughs> Goodness gracious. We have, it's in the home that that diligence is taught. And I'm going to tell you, even as I was preparing for this, even as I'm preparing for the series on masculinity, the Lord has used it in my life and explained to me and reminded me that intent is an insufficient desire to accomplish the goal of training your children to love God. And boy, do I have excuses. Mm. So did Gideon. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine living in fear of the Midianites. Imagine living when you couldn't even thresh your wheat out in the open. Imagine living and being the least of your family and the least of your, your tribe. Imagine living with all of the detriments and difficulties. Listen, can I tell you? God did not give the, the responsibility to the mighty and to the strong. In fact, he gives it to the weak so that his strong, strength can be made more evident. Because this is what I believe. Gideon enjoyed a moment that was insufficient to train his son. But proper training 
Training God's word will take that spiritual moment and turn it into an abundant life. God wants you to live more than a moment. God wants you to live a life that is abundant in your service and even more than your service, your fellowship with him. He wants our children to be able to charge and serve God and honor God and spread the good news of the gospel to all mankind, not of, out of any obligatory obedience, not because they have to, but because they understand what it is to spend time with the Father. And they're not going to learn that in a moment. And they're not going to learn that by your intent. And they're not going to learn that by just your authority. Remember as a young man coaching some sports and some dads wanted their kids to be just awesome at sports. And the way they would make their kid be awesome at sports is they would kind of will it into them. You will do this. It doesn't work that way. At least not to the point where they enjoy it. Right. You will do this. You will do this. You will do this. And a lot of those kids walk away because they have no will to do it. And Christians, dads, sometimes are guilty. My kids are going to serve God. They're going to serve God because I make them to serve God because I desire, you know, the best way for your children to serve God is for them to see you model it. Amen. How do I make sure my kids are in the, in the Word of God every day? You be in the Word of God every day. Amen. How do, my, how do I make sure my kids are learning to pray? You pray. Amen. Hey, isn't that what their mothers are for? Well, praise the Lord for the ministry of mothers. Praise the Lord for that. And mothers are immensely important. But can I tell you, there's something about a father leading his children to God. There's something about a father preparing his children for battle. There's something about a father that doesn't tell his son to run off the battle. He tells his son, come on, let's go to battle together. And this is not going to happen by intent. So if you don't get anything else, I hope this rings through your mind. My intent or desire for my children to serve God will not produce a transformed life. But my willingness to walk with God and be transformed myself is a much more viable opportunity and invitation to train my children up to serve God and honor God. Amen. Well, see, preacher, what do I do today? Well, let me just tell you, you can have a moment right now, okay? Sometimes when we're stressed or we're overwhelmed, we need a moment. Just give me a moment. Sometimes when we come to a big spiritual thing, you know, we're like, ah, oh, this is my moment. And praise the Lord, we come to the altar. But we're not looking for moments. We're looking for movement. Let me just give you these three things and I'll be done. If you want to make a movement... You have to be willing to leave where you are. Amen. One of the hardest things for fathers to say is I messed up. That's a tough one. Yeah. We have this strange, all the women I think will, under they laugh to themselves because we <laughs> tend to think if we don't say it, nobody will know it. <laughs> if I don't say I messed up, then nobody will know I messed up. <laughs> what an illusion, okay? Your wife's looking at you like, uh, I've known it for years. You know, I, before I come to my wife, I say, you know what, I, I just don't think this is the right thing for me to do. And she was trying, you know, she's trying to do, and, but I could see it in her eyes. She's like, well, finally. <laughs> Duh. And it just hit me like, this is not good. Listen, you have to leave where you are. You have to go back and you have to create a new starting place where you say to your children, you say to your wife, what I was doing was just intent. It wasn't training. What I was doing was just intent, not training. The second thing is you have to get over the hump. When you start doing something, man, it's going to look like it doesn't work. Can you mean a person that was not training their children starts training their children? Guess what those children are going to do? You know, push back a little bit. 
I don't like this. I'm going to start training you to serve God and honor God and love God. Oh, that'd be great, Dad, until it starts. <laughs> you got to get over the hump. In other words, you have to risk them liking you. I don't mean be vicious or mean or abusive by any means. But you have to risk because they'll like you for very little. You don't have to do much for them not to like you. You have to get over the hump, which means your security comes in God. from God. Your validation doesn't come from their approval. It comes from God. So you have to leave where you are. You have to get over the hump. And you have to keep going. You have to keep going. Amen. People that leave where they are and they start training and then they stop, guess what they had? A moment. A moment. Yeah. A moment. And Christian kids, kids who are growing up in Christian houses, who see moments and moments and moments and moments, they begin to realize, well, apparently this is not as important as they say it is. And it becomes actually counterproductive. You've got to keep going. And keep going. Uh, preacher, but what if they still don't serve God? Are they breathing? Keep going. Your role may change. That role that you have with a five-year-old, that role that you have with a 12-year-old, and the role that you have with a 35-year-old, it may change. But you keep going. That's right. Keep modeling. Amen. I'm realizing there's some things that I'm, God is teaching me now that I would have loved to have known when Jackson was little. Oh, I would have loved to have known that. And I have to go up to him and be like, Sorry. <laughs> you know, all this stuff that God's teaching me about how I should do with my sons. And I, sorry. My bad. Grace of God. <laughs> but I can't, use, I can't allow that sadness to stop me from doing what I need to do. Right. Amen. Right. That'd be like putting my head in the sand. Admit your error. Get over the hump. And keep on going. And honor God, because intent will not produce a transformed life. But according to the scripture, training will. Amen. Every moment Amen. of every day. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us.